So we're going to do our introit now. Number 672, Spirit of the Living God. Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. Father in heaven, may the prayer of each of our heart today be fall afresh on me. May each one of us experience the falling of the Holy Spirit on us and the drawing of your spirit into a closer relationship with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Has this been a good week for all of you? It's been a good week for me. And it's been a blessing Sabbath day because my nephew's here, Josiah Martin. So may God be with each and every one of you. And I want to read something which all can be blessed from this scripture. Psalms 57, I pray for safety. Be merciful to me, O Lord, be merciful. I come to you for safety. In the shadow of your wings, I will find refuge. The rainstorm has passed. Cry out to the Most High God who fills his purpose in me. He sent help from heaven to save me and you. He will shame those who will, excuse me, who will refuge me. I know he loves me and he steadfast his faithfulness in all of us. May God be with each and every one of you on this Sabbath day. Our next song is number 487 in the garden. Please stand.
his face and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is
Good morning, church. Good morning. I'll be reading the scripture this morning. It's John chapter 20, and I'll be reading from 11 to 14. And the context is, uh, this takes place in a garden near the area where Jesus was crucified. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had said thus, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. During the first century uh, after Christ, there was much debate and discussion, argument, and even squabbling over certain teachings, certain doctrines. One of them was who Jesus was. And it was interesting that many of the church leaders, many of the uh, missionaries, many of the members of the church back in those early years thought that Jesus was man. Writers spoke against that. Some said that Jesus was God. And some weren't sure what he was weren't sure which side of the issue to make their voice known. And so it was quite a discussion. In fact, in the church today, it is still quite a discussion. Seven months ago, I was in Collegedale, Tennessee, spending some time with family, and we went to one of the Adventist churches and the sermon, all one hour and 10 minutes of it, was on who Jesus is, the nature of Christ. We even have discussions in this church here in Ojai about who Jesus really is. Is he man? Some say yes, he's a man. He got hungry like all men do. He got tired. He got sleepy, as we all do. And others of us talk about, well, Jesus was God. He was able to do things that you and I can't do. Uh, there was the transfiguration on Mount Tabor when Christ was transfigured. We don't know exactly what that all meant. Uh, it's not clear in scripture, but something, something uh, occurred with Jesus there on the mountain. And so uh, we're going to take a look at who Jesus is in John chapter 20. We cannot cover this topic and this question exhaustively today. If you're looking for a complete presentation on this subject, uh, we can't do it in one presentation. But what we will do is we will look at chapter 20 of John and we will pull from this chapter some significant, some important uh, ideas and uh, passages in scripture. So let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we?
O Father in heaven, make us more Christ-like. As we study and read, help us to understand what Christ was like, who he was, and make us more Christ-like as well. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to begin with chapter 20, verse 4. So John chapter 20, verse 4. And remember, we're looking to see who Jesus is and why that's important. You may say, well, I know that Jesus loves me and that's all that matters. Well, there may be a little more that would be beneficial for us, for us to know. It's important for us to know who Jesus is, who Jesus, the one who loves us so much, really is. And so, chapter 20, starting with verse 4, says, So they both ran, that's Peter and John, so they both ran together, and the other disciple, John, outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, who, and, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there. And verse 7 and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. What's the significance of the fact that, that uh, the handkerchief was folded? The significance is that obviously someone was not in a rush, but took their time to fold that handkerchief neatly and tidily. It's interesting that uh, Jesus took the time to tend to that little detail of the handkerchief. It shows that, that something deliberate happened. It wasn't just off the cuff. It was a matter of choice, a deliberate action on Jesus' part. And when, when John saw the linen clothes and the handkerchief that had been around Jesus' head, uh, and the handkerchief folded in a place by itself, that was enough for John. That's all John needed. At that moment, he believed Jesus was more than just a man. At that moment, he recognized that Jesus was alive. He didn't see him, he was somewhere but he was alive because he had taken the time to fold the handkerchief. The soldiers wouldn't have done that. The women that were with Jesus hadn't been there yet. They had been uh, where they were spending the night. And so it says in verse 8, Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first that's John, went in also, and he saw and believed. This is an, an, an impressive turn of events, an impressive um, understanding on the part of John. John, at that moment, believed that Jesus was more than man. At that moment, John believed that Jesus 
was something unique, someone unique, someone special. Let's look at uh, verse 9. For as yet they did not know the scripture. What a profound statement. The disciples knew Jesus, but they didn't know scripture. They knew Jesus as a man, but they didn't know the scriptures in the fullest sense. They didn't know uh, what it meant for Jesus that he was more than a man. They didn't understand, understand scripture. And it says in verse 9, For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. They, they had heard him talking about his death and his crucifixion, but they didn't know that he was going to be crucified and then resurrected. They, they didn't know the scripture on that point. They didn't know what the Bible said. It's profound. There are times when you and I don't know what Scripture means for us. There may be a passage of Scripture that uh, you sense is a special message for you, but you don't understand it fully. You go to Scripture and you have only an incomplete understanding. That's the way it was for John and Peter. It says, for as yet, they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Verse 10, then the disciples went away again to their own homes. They didn't stay in the upper room. This was uh, two or three days after the crucifixion. And now it says they went away to their own homes. Verse 11, but Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And verse 12, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one on the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, it's interesting, a very dear pastor friend of mine, and I used to spend a lot of time together. We'd go to seminars together, go for special pastoral retreats together, and he called me the garden, gardener. And I used to say, no, it's gardener. And he said, no, it's the gardener. And it was his little joke that he had for me. In fact, he wore it out, in my opinion. <laughs> wore it out a long time before he quit. It's interesting that she thought Jesus was the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. Mary actually thought that she would carry Jesus to another place by herself? Interesting. It's interesting to look at the human nature in this chapter 20. 
she, she didn't realize that this was Jesus because she didn't understand scripture either. Peter and John didn't understand scripture. None of the disciples understood the scripture. And Mary certainly didn't understand scripture. There was Jesus and she thought it was the gardener. Isn't it interesting how we have misconceptions and misunderstandings? In fact, just this morning I heard uh, two of the leaders of the church discussing the fact that some believe this, some believe that, some probably believe things that aren't right. Some people believe things that are incomplete. In fact, we're told that at the end of time, new understandings will be discovered in God's word. I want to be part of that, don't you? I want to be involved in that, God willing. And so she thinks Jesus is the gardener and she offers to carry him away if the gardener would just tell her where he is, what was done with his body. Let's take a look at verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned around and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Mary knew that Jesus was a teacher, but didn't know that he was much more than a teacher. And then it says, in verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go and tell my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. What a powerful passage that is. What a powerful verse. She was evidently holding on to Jesus' feet. Uh, she was holding maybe on to his hands and clinging, it's, it says. In some versions, it says touching. She touched him, and Jesus said, don't touch me. But in this version, she says, uh, he says to her, don't cling to me. And this is the New King James Version. And... Um, so why did, she, why did Jesus ask her not to cling to him? Well, some authors, some commentators say that it was because Jesus was telling her to go and tell the disciples what she had seen, who she had met, that she had met Jesus. Um, in fact, it says in verse 17, go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So um, maybe Jesus told her not to cling to him because he had a work for Mary to do. He had an errand that he was sending her to do and that is to tell the good news. It's interesting that many Bible scholars believe that in this passage, in this verse 17, it signifies, it indicates that um, there's more important than the death and resurrection of Jesus, that equal to the resurrection of Jesus is the ascension of Jesus to his Father in heaven. Uh, there are three aspects of Christ's sacrifice, his death, 
his resurrection, and his ascension. And that's what Jesus is addressing here. He says, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. And so he addresses two very important concepts here in this one verse. The concept of the ascension being important, not just important, but essential to the gospel narrative. His ascension is imperative to the work that Christ came to do. And he was also uh, giving a job to Mary. Jesus could have gone and told the disciples. How come Jesus didn't do it? Why did he ask her to do it? And he didn't do it because it was time to give the task. It was time to make true disciples out of them. Even, even Mary and the women, they had a work to do. They had a ministry to do. Do you have a ministry? Have you learned what your ministry is? For some of you, it's writing letters. You know, for others, it's ministering on the phone. And it doesn't matter how old we are. We can always find a good reason to talk on the phone, can't we? Some of us are phone-aholics, and we spend a lot of time on the phone, especially these cell phone devices that we have. And uh, so Jesus is saying, put it to use. Make good ministry out of your phone addiction. And it doesn't matter how old you are. If you're 98, you can still talk on the phone. You can still do God's work on the phone. And God may still have a work for you to do, even though you have limitations and uh, older age. Verse 18. In verse 18, it says, Mary... Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. This was stunning. They knew he was dead. They saw him die on the cross. They saw his body being lowered off of the cross. They saw him being carried to the tomb. And she's seen Jesus. It says Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Amazing. Not just that she saw him. You know, a lot of people claim they see things that they don't really see. And so not only did she see Jesus, but she says that he had spoken these things to her. It's interesting. The... Uh, the various steps in spiritual growth and development here in this chapter. It's very interesting to see in just a few hours' time how John and Peter and then Mary and then the other disciples came to uh, see that Jesus truly was resurrected and that their whole understanding of the work of Jesus was turned upside down on its head. It completely stunned them and shattered their ideas. And then verse 19, it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now wait a minute. The doors are locked. The doors are shut. They're inside. It's Sunday evening, the third day. And they've secured themselves 
It's very clear to say that they specifically secured themselves in this upper room because it says they were afraid of the Jews. And so, of course, they would have taken extra precaution to secure the door. But Jesus shows up. How? How did he come to be in the room? Was he in the room before they locked the door and they didn't see him? That's not what it says. It says they were assembled for fear and the doors were shut and Jesus came and stood in the midst. He came after the door was locked. He came after it was secured. This is incredible. This is, this is not normal human uh, ability. He somehow uh, invisibly crossed the space from outside to inside the room. They, uh, Jesus somehow miraculously entered that upper room without damaging the wall, without leaving any mark, and stood in the midst of them. I'd like for us to look at John chapter 9, and we'll look at verse 22. Uh, by the way, I'm using uh, marginal notes. You, you may be familiar or maybe you're not familiar that the Bible has marginal notes. It has uh, footnotes with each verse sometimes, and sometimes it has um, uh, notes and cross-references at the bottom of the page. Learn to use those cross-references, those footnotes, those marginal notes. Those notes direct you to other passages that give insights and understanding to our Bible study. Learn to use them and uh, to be familiar with them. So let's look at chapter 9 and verse 22. John 9 and verse 22, and it says this. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. No wonder they were afraid. No wonder they locked the door. There was an arrest warrant out on anyone who accepted Christ. If there was such a thing today, which side of the issue would you be on? Would you stand in full support of Christ or would you get up and bar the door? Would you slink in fear in the room? So let's Continue with verse 20. Chapter 20, verse 20. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands. This is Jesus now. Jesus standing in the middle of the room. And it says, when he had said this, peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They didn't even believe that it was Jesus until they saw the prince in his hands and the wound in his side. They didn't know what to make of it. But when Jesus said, peace be with you, and he showed them his scars, it says they were glad when they saw the Lord. They finally admitted this was Jesus. This was Jesus. And they were glad. Uh, are you happy in your relationship with Jesus? 
Are you glad in your relationship with God? Uh, do people around you see that you're glad in your relationship with Jesus? I pray that all of us have a joy about us. Let's continue with verse 24. With verse 24, it talks about one of the disciples named Thomas. Thomas, by the way, had a nickname. I had a nickname with my pastor friend. He called me the gardener. Well, Thomas was called the doubter, doubting Thomas, because he wanted evidence for everything Jesus said. He wanted proof for everything Jesus claimed. And look at verse 24. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Hmm. And now there's a cross-reference with chapter 11, verse 16. Let's go there. Chapter 11, verse 16. Chapter 11, verse 16 says, Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So Thomas is big on making bold statements. Let's go with him so we can die with him. Did he really mean to do that? It doesn't seem so. It says, now Thomas, back in chapter 20, verse 24, now Thomas called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So he claimed that he would go and die with Jesus, and here he's the one disciple missing uh, at the first meeting. When, when Jesus met with the disciples the first time, they were all there, 10 of them. 10 of them were there, but Thomas wasn't. He claimed that he'd die with Jesus, but was absent when it counted. Thomas. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that at lunch, all right? And um, look at John 14. Look at John chapter 14 and verse 5. It says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? They didn't know where Jesus was going. They didn't know the way, the way that he was leading them. And Thomas expresses his doubts. By the way, are you honest enough with God that you can express your doubts to him? Can you disclose the doubts that you have about belief and about God's word and about your life as a Christian? Can, can you express that to Jesus? You know, Jesus can handle anything we tell him. Jesus can hear and help us with any situation we're in. And so, uh, verse 25 is powerful evidence. Evidence is what they were all looking for, especially Thomas. Mary was quick to believe with very little evidence. She heard and she saw him. But James, but John and, and Peter were even more amazing. Peter and John believed when they were at the, at the tomb, at the sepulcher. They saw the, the linen clothes, the grave, grave clothes, the handkerchief. They didn't even see Jesus. They just saw the linen and believed. Mary uh, heard Jesus and believed. Thomas 
Well, he was the last one, the last one to come into agreement. Uh, let's look at verse 25. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, huh, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, this is a week and a half, after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the door being shut. He did it twice. Jesus comes into the room where they are, the upper room, without opening the door, comes through the wall twice. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst of the, and said, Peace to you. And verse 27, Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Wow, what a conversation. How vulnerable Jesus makes himself. He shows the hand, he opens the garment he was wearing and shows the wound on his side. And Thomas needed that. He needed all that evidence because he was, he was the doubter. But Jesus, Jesus didn't hold back. Jesus gave him the evidence he wanted. Isn't that amazing? Even though he was doubting, and testing Jesus and disbelieving. Jesus works with that. He works in spite of that. And uh, it's just amazing. And Jesus says, be, be believing. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And what does Thomas do? This is the crux of our sermon today. This is the major point. This tells us what we're looking for. We're looking to know who Jesus is. We're looking to know, is he God or is he man? We're looking to know, is Jesus man or is he God. Look at what Thomas says in verse 28. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. We know Jesus was a man, it says here, my Lord. And we know that he was God because it says, and my God. By the way, let's go to a passage that you're very familiar with. John chapter 1, verse 1. John 1, verse 1. I hear the pages turning. That's great. When you get there, we'll read the verse together. John 1, verse 1. It says... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later on in the chapter, it says that Jesus was the Word. Jesus was that Word. By the way, does somebody know the verse for that? Tom, can you find it for us? Directly that, 
It had to be Jesus. Yeah. And okay. And um, I'd like us to look at John ten, verse thirty. John ten, verse thirty. So in the beginning, Jesus was with God. In the beginning, Jesus was God. And we're going to look at uh, John 10. John 10, verse 30. And it says, The man answered and said to them, Why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. So the blind man is speaking to the authorities and they ask him, we know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. He's talking about Jesus and the blind man that had been given his sight black back says the man answered and said to them why why this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he's from yet he has opened my eyes and so it refers to the miracle working power of Jesus, but the key to that verse is where he's from. He's from God. And I'd like us to also look at chapter 14, verse 9. John 14 and verse 9. John 14, verse 9 says, Jesus said to them, Have I been so long? Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me? It's interesting. Jesus came to earth for many reasons. One of the reasons Jesus came to earth was so that man would get acquainted with God, so that man would know Jesus, so that we would have an experience with Jesus. And... It's beautiful that it says, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip. And then one last reference that I'd like to share goes with verse 29. Jesus said to to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That is profound. That that Jesus is praising those who will come, those of later generations who don't see Jesus, don't meet Jesus, yet they believe. That is profound. And I'd like us to look at 1 Peter 1.8. Look at 1 Peter 1.8. 1 Peter 1 verse 8 says, Whom having not seen you love, Though now you do not see him, yet believing, 
you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so here, uh, Peter addresses the later generations who did not have the benefit of seeing Jesus or hearing Jesus, and yet they believe, whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Beautiful. I'd like to conclude with these thoughts. I'd like to conclude with these thoughts. Jesus, the disciples discovered, Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully man. Jesus is 100% man, and Jesus is 100% God. How can this be? Well, Jesus is a divine being. Jesus is from heaven, and so he could be 100% man and 100% God. You know, we can argue this. We can debate this. We can tease this point and these questions ad infinitum. But here it is stated in basic terms. I love verse 28. And it says, And Thomas answered and said to Jesus, My Lord and my God. I also like verse 29. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And Jesus truly did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. It's very clear. There shouldn't be a debate. Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully man. He is both miraculously bound up in one. Do you doubt here in verse 28 and 29 is evidence. Is your doubting answered by these two verses? If I have any questions about who Jesus is, these two verses satisfy me. They answer my doubts. They answer my questions. It's convincing evidence. It's convincing evidence. Do you disagree? This is truly the evidence that we need. It is sufficient evidence. And God is challenging each of us to accept this evidence. God is calling you and he is calling me to accept Jesus as our Lord and our God. He is our everything. Dear God, thank you for what we've seen in your word today. Thank you for giving us all the evidence we need. Thank you that we can know you as our God and our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
closing song today is number 462, Blessed Assurance. Please stand. Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us all the evidence we need and that we can rest in joy in the knowledge that you've given us through your word. Thank you that you've told us ahead of time that there will be increase of knowledge even in the last days and that we can be part of that experience as we uh, Find the evidence in your word as we search the scriptures and find in them the truth, the truth in Jesus. Thank you for that, our Lord and our God. Amen.
Oh!